So for the final exam, just this was a reminder as you have in class. Remember, you're supposed to pick a particular general topic from the list that I had and the article that's associated with that topic. And when you read that article by that philosopher, you're going to have to decide whether you agree or disagree with what they're saying, what their main argument is. Remember, the paper is supposed to be at least 1,500 words. That's the requirement. So that translates roughly around six to seven pages double spaced. And that you're going to have to make sure that you cite your paper, so your sources. So that's either MOA or APA citation format. It's up to you, but MOA is usually for liberal arts majors, uh, and APA is usually for science majors. But even if you're, a, let's say, a science major and you still want to do MOA, that's fine. But just to let you know, it has to be one of those two. In text citations are the, usually the um, the most important thing that I've noticed students miss or forget to put. When you cite something or when you're talking about something from the article, from the book, from your sources, in your paper, you have to tell me exactly where it's coming from. So what page did you get that information from? So that should be in there. If you're not quite sure how to do that, talk to me. Send me an email. Uh, that's also what next week is going to be about. So I can give you particular advice. You're like, I'm not sure how to cite uh, this particular paper, so can you help me out? Make sure you look that information up. I have that information posted on the syllabus, remember, where um, you have that link to Al Purdue, which is a really good website. But there's a lot of good sources, not just Al Purdue, but there's plenty of good sources online where you just Google search MOA or APA, and you can see examples and all sorts of things like that. And don't forget the Writing Center. I know the Writing Center is doing a lot of virtual stuff right now, so check with them and ask them questions as well. So yeah, you, you're gonna turn a digital copy in on the day of the final, and we'll get more into that, I think, next week. So coming into the material for this week, what I wanted to do is kind of, I left this theory to the end and for, I think, good reason. So we're talking about virtue ethics this week, and virtue ethics is really different from the other theories. So we talked about Kantian deontology last week. We talked about what are your intentions. Do you have the right intentions? Remember when we talked about act utilitarian approaches, we talked about how, what the consequences are of your actions and how well do they increase happiness overall. But what we left out out of these other previous theories is what does it mean to be a reliably good person though? This is, this is more complicated. The other theories were just talking about your particular action of what you were doing at that moment. But there's another way to look at ethics where you are trying to see, well, wait a minute, what does it mean to be a good person, not just in that moment, but overall in general? And this is where we get to Aristotle and this is where we get to virtue ethics, in that he's gonna say that an act is morally right. You know you're doing the right thing because it's one that a virtuous person Acting in character would do in that situation. What he means by acting in character is that that really authentically is them. It's that person. They're not faking it. They're not pretending to do it because they want praise or they just want people to like them or something. This is who they really are. So I usually contrast that with a, an example in class uh, of this story. I don't know if it's going to work virtually um let me try to play it and let me know if you hear the sound from the story if you're hearing the recording or not so we'll push play and then we're going to find out if we can do this virtually or not It's Friday morning, which is when we hear from StoryCorps celebrating the lives of everyday people. 
and hearing their stories. Today, Maurice Rowland and Miguel Alvarez, they work together at Valley Springs Manor, which is an assisted living home in California, or rather it was. Maurice was a cook, Miguel a janitor, and last fall the company that managed the home abruptly shut it down, leaving many of the elderly residents with nowhere to go. The staff stopped being paid and they all left except for Maurice and Miguel. At StoryCorps they talked about three days in which they cared for abandoned residents alone. Here's Maurice. There was about 16 residents left behind and we had a conversation in the kitchen, what we're we gonna do. If we left, they wouldn't have nobody. We were just the cook and the janitor, but I was cleaning people up, helping them take a bath. I was passing out meds. My original position was the cook, but we had like people that had dementia. I just couldn't see myself going home. Next thing you know, they're in the kitchen trying to cook their own food and burn the place down. You know what I mean? I only go home for one hour, take a shower, get dressed. Didn't be there for 24 hour days. There are people up three in the morning, walking around and... Yeah, you couldn't go to sleep. I'll bring movies from my house. Let's just watch this at three, four in the morning, then they'll go to sleep. Even though they wasn't our family, they were kind of like our family for the short period of time. You know, you feel sad, but you don't want to show them you feel feeling like that, you know? My parents, when they were younger, they left me abandoned. And knowing how they gonna feel, I didn't want them to go through that. I think you're pretty strong for sticking in there. You too, Maurice. If I would have left, I think that would have been on my conscience for a very long time. Maurice Rowland with Miguel Alvarez at StoryCorps in Hayward, California. They cared for elderly residents of Valley Springs Manor until the fire department and the sheriff could come to take over. The incident led to the legislation in California known as the Residential Care for the Elderly Reform Act of 2014, which protects residents from being abandoned after a shutdown. This conversation is archived by the Library of Congress, and you can get the StoryCorps podcast on iTunes as well as at NPR.org. So I hope you guys see why I picked that particular story and what I think you're talking about. What makes them unique? Why did these two gentlemen decide to stay and take care of these elderly people? even if they weren't getting paid. What makes them different versus all the other people who left as soon as they stopped getting paid? Why would they push themselves to help elderly people out that they didn't really know? What's their motivation? Does anybody have any ideas? For one of them, because what was it? Empathy. He mentioned that he was abandoned. Her, his fathers were abandoning him, so he didn't want them to go to the to the same thing. Yeah. No. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. That's a the good other. Point. The the other mentioned conscious, like for some. People, the conscious is like something very, very, can be very powerful. Right. No, those are good points. And I think exactly that's what Aristotle is going to be talking about is that empathy is some emotion that we have that helps motivate us and see, yeah, I know how that person feels. I've been through that too. Um, I want to do something about that for them. And that's something I think we've left out in the other discussions about ethics. So that's why I was saying this theory is really different from what we talked about before. Because the other theories were part of ethics of conduct. Are you doing the right thing or not in that moment? But ethics of character is how can you relate to people? How can you, I guess, identify with people? And that's crucial for Aristotle because Aristotle thought that we 
in general, as people, we're very social creatures. And so to understand us, ourselves, we have to understand how we work in, in society. So the main question for virtue ethics then is what kind of person should I be? That's what you should ask yourself in life. What kind of person are you right now and what kind of person should you be? The should is the normative part, the ethics part. Because you can think about yourself right now and how you are, your personality, how empathetic you are to other people, are you cold, um, all these things. And then the next step for ethics is you should ask yourself, well then, if that's why I'm right now, should I be better? Should I work or strive to be more empathetic, sympathetic to other people? And this is where we get to the Nicomachean ethics and Aristotle. So it's kind of ironic that I'm talking about Aristotle at the end of the class, because you can see Aristotle is roughly around like 300 BC, so 300 years before Jesus, Aristotle was talking about this stuff. But it actually has to do with a lot of uh, modern philosophy and ethics. So in the 1990s, roughly, a lot of philosophers started to rethink ethics and say, well, wait a minute. We usually use these other theories for the most part. Social contract, utilitarianism, the ontology, those were the popular theories. But then philosophers started to say, are we missing something though? What does it mean to be a good person overall? And this is where some philosophers started to come back to Aristotle. And they started reading what Aristotle had wrote before and said, well, wait a minute, this kind of actually makes sense with what we're learning about psychology and sociology. And so I would say that Aristotle is, of course, known as one of the greatest philosophers of all time, if not for some people, they think he is the greatest. And that he's better than Plato, his teacher, in that he could see the whole picture. He could see how society and psychology and biology and all these things kind of work together to make us who we are. So in the Nicomachean Ethics, and that's the reading from the Ethical Life this week, it's not very long, but I want you guys to read that because in it, he's gonna, it's a speech he's giving to these politicians at the time. And he's trying to lay out what it means to be a good citizen. And this is where I was saying that ethics and being a good person kind of overlap with other issues like political science. What does it mean to be a good citizen? is also what it means to be a good human being. He didn't see a difference in that. I think we see a difference in that where say, well, I'm a good person, but my politics, you know, is separate from, you know, who I am. For Aristotle said, no, your politics is not separate from who you are. You can't just say, well, you know, politically I believe this, but really I live this way. Like, so that doesn't seem rational. Like that doesn't seem like, really realistic. So he's talking to these politicians and then he's telling them, okay, this is what's gonna make a good citizen. This is why you should care. Because you want good citizens in your country, this is what a good citizen is gonna look like. They're gonna be a good person overall. And how do you make a good person? This is where it gets deep in, into his philosophy. In that he says you have to have virtuous people. Virtuous people, and we'll talk about virtue right now, is somebody who sees the right way to act and feel and approach things. And they avoid extremes. That's the big thing for virtues. Virtues are not extremes. They're, they're the opposite. So but think about it for a second, and this is really important. Remember when we talked about natural law and I introduced Aristotle for the first time and we said, well, Aristotle didn't think that anybody was born a good person, but that they become a good person, right? They learn to be a good person. So that goes back to the telos. Remember, it's theological. 
theological meaning that something has a purpose and end and that everybody or everything around us for a subtle including plants animals all have potential we all have telos we can all grow and become something and if that's true for people then who is he really concerned about then Eric? who is Aristotle really concerned about he's talking to the politicians he's trying to tell them this is what is going to make a good person you need to do these things but is he trying to make the people a good person? So you're trying to make the politicians a good person. What's wrong with the idea that the politicians are going to become a good person? Okay, so what we're talking about right now is what it takes to be a good person, right? And I said, Aristotle was giving this big speech to the politicians at the time, but it doesn't seem really realistic that the politicians are going to be good people because Aristotle is going to give them this speech about how to be a good person. Probably not. Probably because I don't think politicians were particularly that much different than they are now, back then. But why would he tell the politicians this on how to be a good person why would he try to convince them to listen to him about what it makes what it means to be a good person who is he really trying to make a good person who is he trying to talk to really who will who, who does he really want to change to become a better person? Because if the politicians are already corrupt, politicians are already not that different from they are today, who does he have in mind of really doing all this effort for? Who does he really want to help? They do share ideas, right? This is... This is good. So this is important. He, the politicians, they make laws, right? And the laws affect who? Who's affected by the laws that politicians make? And this should be really relevant right now, considering the virus and whether Trump wants to open up, you know, businesses, things like that. Who do the laws affect? Who's it going to affect that if, if we decide to open up all these businesses and people are going to start going outside again? Yeah, exactly, citizens. It's going to affect all of us. Remember what I said, the laws come from the ethics. And then if the ethics are bad, the laws are going to be bad and they're going to affect all of us. And so, Aristotle's thinking, instead of going door to door and trying to like, you know, convert people or something and say, hey, this is, you should believe this, saying, why don't I talk to the politicians? I want to talk to the people who are in charge, who have the most influence, who affect everybody's lives. I need to talk to them and see if from there, it's kind of like a top down sort of approach. Let me start at the top and see if I can influence everything else. And in particular, you have to think about it. If everybody has a potential to be a good person, everybody has these potentials, who has the most potential in society? Who do we consider ha who has the most potential? What group in society would have the most potential to change? Exactly, children. This is what he has in mind. This is not for the politicians. So when he, when he wrote this, he wasn't trying to give this to politicians to suddenly change and become good people. He's thinking about the children at the time and future generations. That, remember he says, no one is born good. The 
learn to become great. So he's talking about children. And this is why I'm giving you kind of a, okay, so this is a spoiler alert for this class. According to Aristotle, because <laughs> we're all, you're all taking ethics, right? You're all adults. Aristotle would probably say that if you're not a good, empathetic, caring, and compassionate person, right now as an adult, before taking this class, it's probably too late for you anyways. Why would he say that? Why would he say it's probably too late? Not that it's absolutely 100%, but he's saying it's probably too late to be a good person if this is who you are as an adult. So if you're kind of a stingy person, you're kind of a really cold person, why is he saying that it's kind of probably too late for you to learn to be good? Like this ethics class is not going to really change who you are. Why would he say that? Right. Because you already have these habits. Your entire life, right? Up to you when you're an adult now, is that you've done these particular things. If you've been very cold with people, it's something that's really a part of you. It's a character trait that you have, right? And so it's really difficult for you to learn to be a different way. And this is why I think Aristotle is thinking about why don't we try to help children, why don't we try to help and teach people when they're young, not wait until they're adults and then they already have these bad habits that are going to be hard to break, right? And I want you guys to think about this because, and this goes to the next slide, and this is where we get the politics, and this is what I'm saying, politics and ethics for Aristotle are intertwined. They're not the same thing, but, you know, they overlap and they affect each other. So there's this document that I found some years ago. This is a political document, and it says, uh, protecting our children, parental rights and responsibilities. We believe that parental rights, authority, and responsibilities are inherent and protected by the United States Constitution. Local, state, or federal regulation, laws, regulations, or policies shall not be enacted that limit parental rights in the reign of both biological and adopted children. Parents have the right and responsibility to direct and guide their children's moral education. We strongly support a parental rights amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Now think of what this political document is saying. This is really important. If they're talking about children, they're saying that the laws, right? There shouldn't be any laws that limit what the parents decide they want to do with both their biological children or if they've adopted children. And that the parents have the right and responsibility to direct and guide their children's moral education to be a good person. And that they want some sort of amendment to the Constitution that's going to say that. And notice what else they say here about knowledge basis. So this is about education. They said that this document is saying that we oppose the teaching of hierarchy thinking skills, value clarification. Remember we talked about values, about happiness, justice, autonomy. They're opposed to teaching those kind of things. Critical thinking skills, remember logic. And similar programs that are simply relabeling of outcome-based education mastery learning so you learn something you demonstrate that you mastered something which focus on the behavior modification so these things change your behavior and have the purpose of challenging the students fixed beliefs so you you might change your mind your beliefs and undermine parental authority and you might disagree with your parents so they don't want people to learn these values or value clarification, right? They don't want 
you to think about your values. They don't want you to start thinking about things critically, logically. They don't want those kind of influences that might change your behavior and might change your beliefs and might get you to disagree with your parents. And they're telling you that really when it comes down to it, it's only the parents who will teach you right from wrong. Nobody else should. So who, what document do you think this is from? Anybody have any ideas about who's saying all this? Because these two quotes are from the same document. And it's a political document. Anybody want to guess where this is from? So this document is the official document, and I'll check for this year too. Notice the years, 2012, 2016, when we're around political seasons, voting season. This is what the Republican Party of Texas is saying. This is their official document. This is what they're saying. This is what we believe in. This is what we want the state to do. This is what they're writing on. They're saying, this is what we really believe. Which I bring this up because this is in stark, not so much against that it's Republicans, but I think this is really almost the opposite of what Aristotle is saying, right? To kind of show you the difference in politics and the difference in, in ethics. Aristotle saying that it's all of our responsibility. It's not just the parent's responsibility. It's everybody's responsibility. He's thinking about all the children in society, not just his children, right? And I, and what is Aristotle? Aristotle is the father of logic. All that logic stuff that we spent all those weeks on and stuff, Aristotle is the philosopher who started a lot of that logic. And so, He's talking about ethics now. He wrote about logic. And what he said, well, this is, I mean, this is the issue I, I see a lot in many of my classes that we say, well, it's the parent's responsibility to teach you right from wrong. Well, what's the problem with that though, with that approach? What's the, remember we talked about logic, what's the implied, Premise there. What's the assumption that they're making when they say your parents will teach you right from wrong? What are we assuming? Right, that the parents are going to educate them, like the parents know right from wrong. But we don't consider, well, what happens if you have parents who are selfish? What happens if you have parents who are mean, who are abusive, right? What kind of habits, what kind of things are you going to learn in a household, in a family where the parents are really abusive? If you think about it psychologically, and this is why a lot of the philosophers started going back to Aristotle, people who abuse other people tend to have been, not all the time, but tend to have been abused themselves. They learn these traits, right? When they're growing up, they were abused. And when these children grow up, they tend to abuse their children, right? And this is how it keeps going on. And I think this is where the Republican Party of Texas, when they wrote this, is not thinking about that. They're not thinking about, well, what happens when your parents aren't 
the best people, what kind of values are you going to learn? What kind of habits and traits are you going to walk away with? And this is important too, because this is not just about your family, right? This would also be about the fact that if you're a citizen of that country, or not even a citizen like in the legal sense, I'm just saying that you live there with other people in the community. If you're a mean person and you're teaching your children to be mean as well, maybe you don't realize it, but those are just your habits, right? Aren't your children good? Aren't those children going to go to school with everybody else's children? You probably bully them, right? And is it going to affect everybody around us? So this is why Arisal is thinking, you have to look at the big picture. You can't just look at your family. I mean, this, I think the virus is such a good example, unfortunately. It's really sad, but it's a very good example of ethics and how if we don't take what we do seriously, it does affect other people, right? I mean, this is the whole thing. There was that protest the other week downtown, right? Which I live not too far from downtown, where people are going out there protesting that they want to open businesses again and go out there. But this is the issue, right? Yeah they could be affecting other people, right? I saw some uh, video footage, not necessarily here, but at other protests where some of these people brought their children to the protests. But then that was the whole thing. They're putting their children at risk, right? By taking them out there in a crowd of people yeah so i i think this is what we should be balancing about there's some politicians right now that are doing you know maybe business and economic issues are more important than human life right human beings potential so this is something that i think is really serious and if we talk about children this same document though i have to admit also which is confusing for me, is that they also say that children don't have rights, according to the Republican Party of Texas. So the UN, the United Nations, they had uh, tried to pass this, this amendment that said no matter where children are, no matter what country or government, that Governments have the responsibility to take all available measures to make sure children's rights are respected, protected, and fulfilled. The Republican Party of Texas says, no, they reject that. That children don't have rights, that it's not the government's responsibility to protect children's rights. The governments get to do whatever they want. It's more like what we talked about with uh, cultural relativism, right? where it's each culture decides what's right or wrong. So the UN is saying, well, it doesn't matter what culture, it should be universal, right? It's objective that no matter where you're at, children should be respected. So I bring these examples up to show you how different the political view is, right, to what Aristotle was talking about with politics. And that it's kind of ironic that all this semester, this entire semester, right? I think I've been trying to teach you guys all this stuff, right? The knowledge-based education. I've been trying to teach you guys, well, let's talk about values. What's important? Autonomy, happiness, justice. Think about your life. Try to get you guys to think about things logically, right? How to use logic to decide what's rational, what's not. What's a good argument, what's not a good argument and behavior, right? To think about and change maybe your beliefs. And maybe you, after this class, maybe you will think about, well, wait a minute, maybe my parents didn't teach me something, or maybe you disagree with your parents now about something and say, well, wait a minute, maybe this is a different way to approach this. So I think I've been trying to get you guys to do that, but this is why this is why education is also gets very political as well, right? So 
I don't know if you know, but in the university system that we have, there's a board for university of UT system, right? University of Texas, like uh, system. So that's University of Texas of Austin, of Utah, of El Paso. There's a board that decides what you guys should learn, what kind of classes you guys should take. And those people are chosen by the governor. Those are voted. We don't get to decide who's on that board. It's the governor who picks those people. So whatever the governor's politics are, whatever they believe, their ethics is gonna be reflected in the people that they choose to decide what kind of education you get. So it is really important. It influences what you learn here in, in college and what kind of values you, you develop is decided by other people and what they believe. So this is where who you vote for, right? It's really important because it affects you. And I think Aristotle understood that. So there's this other story I wanted to play about this kid in New York and to show you why it's so important of what environment you grow up in. So let me know, I'm gonna play it and let me know if you can hear it or not. Can you guys hear it or no? Okay, let me fix that real quick. I think I know what's going on. Let's try again. One third of children in New York City grow up in poverty, and we're about to meet one of them, 17-year-old Jairo Gomez. He says he doesn't want to wind up in the same position as his parents, but the vicious cycle of poverty makes his ambitions hard to achieve. His story comes to us from Radio Rookies, a youth media program at member station WNYC. Get out. There are nine of us in my family, and we live in a one-bedroom apartment. I share a bunk bed with my sister, Judy. I mean, it's just so stuffed, and like, we don't have enough space for seven kids. On the floor, we have two mattresses side by side where three of my other sisters sleep. You have to step toe to heel to get out of the room. All we actually need is like a big closet. <laughs> <laughs> my mom, stepdad, and the two youngest ones sleep in the living room. Tell me about like your work. What do you do? Uh, so you a cleaner, cleaner lady. My mom cleans Limpia. other people's houses. Limpia. When she gets home, she keeps on cleaning and takes care of my sisters and brother. I used to think of my family as middle class, but after my parents split up, my mom had four more kids. Do you think we're poor? The truth is, I haven't looked it up in the dictionary. The word poor. Para mí, to me, poor is when. You don't have enough for soup or a roll of toilet paper. Un rollo de papel. During my freshman year in high school, I wore ripped jeans and my sneakers had holes in them. It was kind of embarrassing, but I still didn't think I was poor. I asked my mom to do the math, and she said right now, my family makes 30000 a year. According to the federal government, we're $15,000 below the poverty line. I mean, that kind of scares me. I've seen articles posted on Facebook about how unlikely it is to get out of poverty, how poor people usually stay poor. If I don't get an education, I'll be stuck like my parents. But I haven't always been able to make school my priority. When I was younger, I felt like a robot. All I did was go home and help babysit and clean. Yo. I never had that freedom before to be able to hang out and skate with my friends. So in ninth grade, I started cutting every day. And then when I was in the 10th grade for the second time, my mom started asking me if I could stay home from school to watch the kids. If I said no, most of the money she would make would go to a babysitter. I failed every class that year. 
that made me finally realize that if I ever wanted to graduate, I needed to be in school. I switched to a transfer school and my first trimester, I got perfect attendance. I told my mom I wasn't going to take care of the little ones anymore. Remember when I would tell you that you weren't being responsible for your kids? At first I felt annoyed, like, how could this kid dare say that to me? When I feel that I try my best to give what's necessary. But then I thought about it and I thought, maybe I'm not doing my job right. I'm not providing enough. Hearing her say that made me feel selfish. Especially since now, my sisters are stuck at home every day. Sometimes I wish, like, yeah, you would stay home and, like, help. Judy is 14. She and my older sister are always home babysitting, cleaning up after my little sisters, and helping feed them. Why do you still change diapers and do all that? I don't want to put this all on mom. It's just... I mean, compare yourself, I guess, to me. What do I do around the house? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. My oldest sister, Sadie, is like the second mother, and she's in college. Right now I have to finish my paper, this eight-page paper. Okay, but what else am I irresponsible about? Because I don't think babysitting is my responsibility. Why is it not your responsibility? Because I didn't make them. Sometimes I feel like I blame my mom too much for having more kids than she could afford. She's always telling us we're lucky because we'll have each other to go to. But when we still had two of our sisters in diapers, and the pregnancy test came out positive again and again, Judy, Sadi, and I were like, I'm not washing the bottles this time. Is that why you had us? Like all of us? I asked my mom why she had so many of us. With each pregnancy, I accepted it and let it happen. And I felt happy, but I never thought this son I'm going to have, I'm going to educate and motivate to become a doctor, or this daughter I'm going to have, I'm going to motivate to become a lawyer. The job of the mother is to feed and clothe them, to give them love. But maybe I didn't have time to give them each enough love. Do you remember last year when I had to stay home to babysit? How do you think it affected my grades? Academically, it affected you a lot. I did wrong in making you stay, but I didn't have an option. At the time, I sacrificed you. It was either good grades for you and you'd go to school, or we were going to suffer and lack necessities. I don't feel sacrificed. To me, sacrifice is being given up. She just delayed me. Sometimes I feel guilty that you haven't graduated, but I feel like you've contributed so that economically things aren't so tough. It's a balance. It gets me mad that my mom works so hard, and there are people out there who are just born into it. They make money like nothing. They don't have to clean houses, wake up early, drain themselves. I needed to make some money for myself, so I took a week-long carpentry job. I knew it meant I'd be making less than minimum wage, and I'd have to miss school, but I was failing the second trimester anyway. When I went back to school the next week, I checked in with my English teacher, Erin. I still had a chance to pass it. I did. Yes, you definitely could have passed my class. Did failing your classes push back your graduation date? I think it did. Okay. I was working for less than minimum wage. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to do that for like the rest of my life. I know I should be thinking about going to college when I graduate if I don't want that life. But I'd have to stay at home to afford it. Nine of us in a one bedroom apartment, no privacy, one bathroom, and toys everywhere. I don't know if I can make myself do it. Now I'm working 13 hour shifts, making food deliveries on a bike. Honestly, I'd rather do that and earn money for my own place. We're told, if you work hard, you'll get results. But for my family, there haven't been any results. Just survival. For NPR News, this is Jairo Gomez in New York. Jairo's story comes to us from Courtney Stein and Kari Pitkin at WNYC's program, Radio Rookies. So that story I think is important because I think it, illustrates what Aristotle is talking about. Because if you can hear that he's struggling, 
So what are his choices? What's the dilemma? What is his moral dilemma? What, what sort of issue is, does he have to deal with and decide to do? What's the challenge that he's facing right now? Right, that's exactly it. That's what he's facing is that he has to decide if he's gonna give his efforts to his education and graduate and maybe go to college, or if he's gonna take care of, help take care of his brothers and sisters, right? Do you see how difficult that the choice is? Is his is it his fault that he has to make that decision? Did he put himself in that kind of situation? No, right. He was born to that situation, right? It's not his fault that his family is in that situation. It's not his fault that they're living like that. And I think this is why Aristotle thought it was important. He understood that how children grow up, where they grow up, their society is not something that they have control over. But it affects them, right? It affects who they are, what habits they learn, it affects their lives later. So all these things are important to Aristotle, but he also understands that they don't really have control over it, right? So this is why I think uh, Aristotle wants to stop, start at the top, right? He says, I can't go to door to door and I guess convince family to family, right? That what I'm doing right now is what I'm telling them, right? The philosophy that I'm telling them, how to live, how to grow and develop, it would take forever. And some people, I mean, this is the whole thing with conversion and, and how people get annoyed on Saturdays, right? In the morning when people knock on your door. I don't think Saturday morning knocking on somebody's door is going to convince them, right? Necessarily, it's not a good way. I think Aristotle understands this and what he wants us, what he wants to do then is that say, well, wait a minute, how in the bigger picture, how do we structure society? not how I save people's individual souls or, you know, their situations. Like, I have to look at the big picture of how does government influence every one of us, regardless of our religion, regardless of our background, government seems to influence our everyday lives and what kind of laws and values we learn. So I think that's his view. And this is why he's, I gotta ask himself, then what does it take to flourish? What does it take to grow and really develop as a human being? So for Aristotle's philosophy, everything has, remember we said everything has a soul for Aristotle. Plants have souls, animals have souls, people have souls. It's just a different level of complexity. So what does it take for a human being to reach their level of potential? And he makes a list, this is the list. It says that preservation of human life. So at the very basic fundamental thing, you have to survive, you have to live, right? You have to have avoidance of harm, that you're not in danger. Basic functions that animals and humans have in common. Food, right? Water. This is why it's important. This is the whole political issue. And it's not a, just a political issue, I think it's a, a human rights issue about uh, the fact that in Flint, Michigan, they still don't have water that's drinkable, right? And that's a really, I think, relatable issue to us as well in the Southwest and in Mexico, is that what's your access to clean water? 
is really just basic. I mean, before we start talking about schools and all that, do children have access to clean water? But what separates us from the animals, according to Aristotle, is this one, the search for truth. What he means by that, I think, is something along the lines of what we call education. That human beings, we need intellectual growth. That it simply can't just be uh, putting food on the table is enough. That we're complicated creatures, we need more than that. Notice in the story right now, what did the mom say was the job of a mother? What are moms supposed to do according to the boy's mother? Because I can relate to this. Right, to love them, food, clothe them, right? So what didn't she think about? So this is something important as well. What did she admit that she wasn't doing or she didn't consider? So she said she gave them the basics, food, water, you know, to love them, right, their education, their future. She didn't think about them becoming a doctor or a lawyer. She didn't think about the larger aspect. And she starts to realize now, maybe she hadn't done enough. Perhaps parenting involves something more than we're accustomed to. And I think that's what Aristotle understood clearly is that when he talks about the search for truth, about education, he's talking about in a greater sense, not just a degree, but learning something of the world, learning and developing your values. What I try to make this class about, something that actually affects your life, something that affects who you are, something that makes you a better person in the end. And this is, I thought, really interesting at the bottom here. Nurturing social ties. This is where a lot of contemporary psychology also, I would say, agrees with what Aristotle was saying. So let's say, for example, right now, that you know somebody who, who passed away because of the coronavirus, right? How do you overcome that grief? How do you overcome that loss if somebody you know passed away? What's gonna help you get through these difficult times? I mean, even think about right now, even if you don't know somebody, um, you didn't lose somebody to the virus, who, how are you dealing with it right now? What is helping you get through these days of quarantine? How are you able to overcome the obstacles right now about work, school? What would help you get through that? What's your support? Where are you getting your support? Right, our family, our friends. This is why our subtle saying that social ties, nurturing social ties is crucial, 
that it's a community view. You can't just say, well, I'm going to deal with it on my own. That I don't need any help. That I'll just overcome this. Maybe you could do that, but you're making your life harder in the end. Like your chances of that is really, it's hard to overcome things by yourself, right? Versus doing so with your family and friends and support. And this as a community. And I think family in the sense, I mean, I think also what he means is like family in the sense of not just blood, but a support system. Your neighbors, your friends, all those elements can also be a, a type of family as well, right? It doesn't have to be just blood. So we need all these things to develop and reach our full potential. If we, we have to have a society to do that. I think that was the issue with the young boy in New York is that he doesn't have a lot of the support system, right? And he would probably be easier to overcome a lot of his obstacles with school and who he's developing, I'm sorry, how he's developing and who he's to become if he had a stronger support system. So what Aristotle says is happiness is an activity of the soul in accordance with reason. Think about that for a second. Happiness is an activity of the soul in accordance with reason. What does he mean by that? What is he saying happiness is? It might be a little bit different than we're normally accustomed to about thinking about happiness. What is he saying happiness is? It's not an emotion. What is it for him? According to that quote. Good, exactly. It is a state of being. Happiness is an activity. It's something that you do, not something that you feel. That is crucial. That is, I think, different from what we talk about when we talk about happiness in the more contemporary sense. That he's saying happiness is something that you do every day. It's how you live your life. And that you do so with reason. It's not an emotion, because emotions are just, you don't have to have reasons to feel emotions, right? But then that means emotions get very complicated because sometimes you might not have a good reason if, to do or feel that or yell at somebody, right? Because you're angry. You might not have a good reason for anger. So it has to be reasonable. And notice what else he says. To achieve true happiness, it's not going to come from pleasure, not from feeling good or getting what you want. It's not going to come from being wealthy. It's not going to come from power. It's not going to come from fame. All those only have instrumental values. Remember, intrinsic and in instrumental. Happiness, what he says, is, is, a, is a form of eudaimonia. Remember, we talked about this when we talked about natural law. Eudaimonia is hard to translate. But I think probably the best one is flourishing again. Flourishing is what he means. You should flourish as an individual. If you're really, what, what we call happiness is flourishing for him. That's maybe how we should use the word happiness. That happiness is, happiness is not something that you feel. Happiness is something you are, something that you develop, you grow, and you're becoming a better person. That's the true happiness for Aristotle, that you're taking what you're learning in this class, you're taking this education, you're taking these experiences, and you're becoming something better. If you leave this class the same as you came in, then I haven't done my job. That's basically it. Something that you, yeah, not express in front of everyone, something you, you can do 
on a regular basis, something that is part of who you are. It takes no effort for you to exhibit that. This is why I said it's a skill. It's something that you work on, you develop, you grow into. And that he says, virtuous conduct gives pleasure to the lover of virtue. Think of what that means. Virtuous conduct gives pleasure to the lover of virtue. It's not work to be a good person for yourself. That the virtuous person, the good person, they love to do good things. The compassionate person loves com to be compassionate. It's not something that they're forced to do. It's not something they feel obligated to do. That it's a chore. That are like, oh God, like I have to be compassionate with this person. No, it's something that just comes natural to them and it comes out and it's part of who they are. It's part of how they see things, how they think, what motivates them. This is what on a deeper sense Aristotle is talking about. That there are two types of virtues here. Now this is, I want to make sure everybody understands this. Intellectual virtues and moral virtues. Intellectual virtues are wisdom, prudence, rationality. Those are examples of intellectual virtues. Those things are kind of easy to teach you in the sense that you can learn those maybe from a book, right? I can give you a book on logic. I can give you a book on maybe, you know, how to be prudent. But the moral virtues, those are different. I can't give you a book on kindness and you're going to suddenly know and be kind, right? Like you can't read a book on kindness and then, okay, now I'm a kind person. It doesn't work that way. It's something that you're going to have to go out there. How do you learn to be kind? You actually have to go out there and do kind things. You actually have to go out there and give the effort. How are you courageous? You go out there and do courageous things. Those are things I can't just simply point to in a book and that you'll learn. Questions so far? Okay, so I know we're going a really long, but I, I want to get all of this in there because it's such a, an important theory. So when, we, when he talks about virtues, he talks about things being, so a virtue is something that's a mean between two extremes. So to be courageous, you have to be not a coward, of course, right? That would be a deficiency. That would be too, that would be the low part, the low extreme. But then you're not rash either. That would be the high extreme. So a courageous person is going to do something to confront some obstacle, right? They're not gonna shy away from it, they're not gonna run away from it. But they're not, so they're not a coward, but they're not rash either. So I'll give you maybe a, a possible scenario. Let's say you're walking down the street and somebody is harassing an individual, a group of people is harassing an individual. What do you do? What would be the courageous thing to do if you see a group of, uh, of people harassing somebody. Would it? Good. See, we have a difference of opinion here. What would be the coward thing to do? Yeah, you could just walk away. You could just pretend, uh, I don't see it, not my problem. We know what being a coward looks like, right? They wouldn't even do anything about it. But I think this is where we differ. What would be rash and what would be courageous? I think this is where it's complicated for us. Rash, I would say, this is where it's really contextual. 
if there's a group of guys and they're harassing somebody and I go up there and I say, yeah, you know what? Fuck off. I'll fight you. Right. Well, if it's like a group of seven guys, I'm probably just going to get my ass kicked, right? <laughs> like, and I'm not going to save the person. They're just going to kick my ass and then they kick, go back to kicking the other person's ass or whatever. But it just, it doesn't seem like in that moment that that really helped, right? That that was really courageous. Maybe calling the police, maybe calling other people for help, right? If it was a bar or something, telling the bouncers or whatever, something like that. That would have been, I'm doing something, I'm taking action, but I'm not just rushing into the situation. A coward will run away from it. So this is what Aristotle was talking about. There has to be a balance between running away and just running headlong into something, just, just rushing into something. You have to be able to balance it out. Everything's like that for Aristotle. He thinks temperance, generosity, truthfulness. So like generosity, you don't want to be stingy, but you also don't want to be wasteful. So giving all my money away, giving everything away, maybe would not be the best thing. You know, that kind of person where they'll buy everybody drinks at the bar or something. Well, that might be an excess. The stingy person, they'll never buy another person a drink. So generosity is that the case you'll buy some people drinks and you're not going to those extremes. Same thing, actually truthfulness is, is something I do want to address. It is actually um, something important. I think especially for students like yourselves. What he means by truthfulness is that it's not self-deprecating and it's not boastful. So I see this a lot among students that some students will say, well, I don't know anything, I'm stupid. And that's self-deprecating. They're putting themselves out. They know something, you know something. You have to give yourself some credit. But then I also see on the other side, some students might be really boastful as well, right? And then they'll say, well, I don't even need to study. I don't even attempt to these Zoom meetings or whatever. I got this, I'm fine. They're claiming they know more than they do. So what Aristotle is saying is that the right way to act is to be truthful. You acknowledge what you know and you acknowledge what you don't. That's the right way to do it. And I think that's what really makes a good student and what, you, what makes you a better student and where you really learn is when, you're, when you can honestly say, you know what, I don't know how to do this, I need help, but you have confidence in yourself that you know how to do something and you don't give up completely. Same thing with emotions and actions. Uh, but some things, this is what I was at the bottom of the page, some things, there are several things that there are no good versions. There are only extremes. So if you're spiteful, if you're shameless, and have you seen the show? Envious. Those feelings, those emotions, there's no good version of that. It's not a good balance between anything. Those are already things you want to stay away from. And certain actions, adultery, theft, murder, he's saying, there doesn't seem like a lot of good uh, versions of that. Those are things that are already extreme. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. It's not the whole list of all the virtues. There's many, many virtues. And, and he even says that um, there's some things he didn't even list or haven't thought about yet. You know, he can't put everything down, but you'll know it's a virtue if you can think about how it's the balance between two extremes. So this is what he, this is the theory of the mean. The mean is that you have to see what's a good balance between everything. He says men are good in the one way, but bad in many. So he used the archer analogy before. It's like an archer, when you shoot the bow and arrow, how do you get the target? You can't pull too hard because then it'll go past it, right? But if you don't pull far enough, it's gonna fall short. 
So it takes a lot of practice to get it right. And this is what he means, I think. Being a good person is going to take a lot of practice. It's going to take a lot of work. And it's not something that's just going to suddenly just work out for you. How do you know what a good person is? He talks about it as a moral exemplar. A moral exemplar is, let's say, like a role model. How do I know what courage is? I have to see courage. I have to see people who are courageous. I have to have those role models, somebody who inspires me to be courageous. And that's why I chose this woman here. She was very courageous. Because she's getting arrested. This is during the civil rights movement. She's getting arrested for sitting at a diner where black people were not allowed to sit. Or people of any color, right? Other than what they thought was white, are not allowed to sit there. And she's being arrested. What would be the coward thing to do? Probably avoid the whole situation, right? Probably just say, well, that's just how it is not do anything about it. What would be the rash thing to do? I think probably try to be violent with the police because she's not gonna win. So the courageous thing I think is you're taking a stand, you're doing something, you're taking some action, right? And that's something where it's really hard to do, but it's what he would say that takes to be a good person. That's how I know what courage looks like is that I see somebody who acts in that manner. So they're the one who sets an example. And you can see this, um, I think the book mentions this as well. You can see this in, in how we think of people's behaviors and actions and role models. Uh, I remember, I think it was in high school, like a lot of people were like, what would Jesus do? Like bracelets. And essentially, it's ironic, but it is what Aristotle's talking about. You take a role model, somebody you really look up to, say, well, what would they do in this situation? How would they act? And that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to figure out how you should act is how you think somebody who's courageous would act. Now, it's complicated, though, because what happens when you don't have role models. What happens when you have role models, but they don't agree with each other? Which has happened, I think, before to people like, you go to one parent and they say this, and you go to another parent and they say the opposite. So what do you do? <laughs> it's confusing, right? This is why this theory is really different from the other theories in that it's what we call a form of ethical pluralism meaning that there could be more than one rule to live by. So the other theories just had one rule. Follow this and you'll be fine. Here, it's actually saying that it's, life is complicated and it's gonna take, a, it's gonna take some thought and patience and practice. This is why Aristotle says strict, adherence to rule you know somebody who follows the rules but they always follow it no matter the situation that actually might be an extreme right so if there's no exception whatsoever and you always just have to follow it that could be an extreme so you're not flexible in any situation that's why it takes what we call practical wisdom experience and training how do i know when i see a friend and I'm meeting them for lunch and they don't say anything. They say, they don't say one word to me. They just sit down and I say, are you okay? How do I know to ask that if they haven't said anything to me? Exactly, body language and mannerisms. I have a sense of who they are, how they, what's normal for them, how they usually act, and something is off. But that takes experience, right? That's judging from my past experience from how they normally act. I think 
because we're running out of time here, I want to skip ahead a little bit. This is why emotions are important for him. Other theories, they didn't talk about emotions, but emotions are important. They don't mean that they justify it. Just because you're angry doesn't mean you have a right to be angry. But he's saying anger, fear, guilt, compassion, anxiety, these are telling you something sometimes. If you feel guilty about something, maybe it's something that you need to look at, right? If you're feeling that guilt, maybe you need to take a more sort of uh, evaluation about what you're doing if you're feeling guilty about it. And emotions are something that we learn, right? And this is why it comes back to children again for ourselves. That what lessons we learn, right? What emotions we develop are the habits that are going to help us guide us in life. This is our moral education. This is what the Republican Party text is saying. It's all the parents are supposed to teach you all of what we talked about. This whole class, parents have should have taught you in some way, like all these issues. But I think that's pretty extreme, right? I don't think every parent can do that. I think we're going to need something better than that. Now he does bring up moral luck. I think this is important. Aristotle is going to say that sometimes we don't have control like the kid in new york right it's not our it's not his fault that he was born in that situation he does say some people seem to be born in better situations with money they have less problems aristotle fully understands this that that it's a chance like some people just get lucky and it's something to consider and i think this is why he wants a developed society is that can we give them at least a lot more children than are now more opportunity, right? Doesn't mean everybody's going to be lucky, but we can do better than we're doing right now. That's why I think, say, why don't, that's why I put the question forward. Why don't we have ethics classes for children? Why do we wait until you're an adult and then we're going to teach you how to be a good person? Does it, would it make more sense from an early age if philosophers, if people were teaching children about these things? And so that when they're an adult, when they're of age, they're already familiar. I mean, imagine teaching math not until you reach college, right? How good are you going to be in math if you've never taken a math class before? Now, the last thing that the book doesn't mention before we run out of time here is I think the environment is a huge influence, bigger than the book gives credit for. And I think environment does influence a lot of habits and healthy habits as well versus unhealthy habits. So not, this is where I remember Aristotle was thinking about it all together, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, all these things together. So this is, you can tell us Mesa. Now, this is where I used to live in Canada. Look at the difference in the street. You see people on Mesa? No, you see cars, right? What kind of interactions, what kind of community are you building when everybody just stays inside their car? everybody's isolated i mean we were already isolating ourselves even before the virus right we're not being very sociable in this city we don't learn to develop empathy and sympathy and compassion for other people if we just only view people from our car it's hard to do that and what kind of food think about when you're driving down mesa what kind of food is available this used to be a market that I would go to on Sundays. And you could try out the food. You talk to these farmers, you talk to people, you learn something about them, you develop a relationship with them, and it's healthy, delicious food. I mean, when we 
do things like that, this is maybe something to think about right now. I'm currently subscribing to uh, Desert Spoon, which is one of the global community groups, where I pay them and they deliver to me fresh vegetables and fruit from the local farmers. Yeah, so this is an issue. Like, I think when we think about it, when you go to Walmart, right, which is a terrible situation, like nobody, I have met one person who's like really, you know, excited to go to Walmart. Uh, it's a terrible situation because you're trying to get out of there before the virus. You just wanted to get in and wanted to get out as fast as you can. You don't talk with people, you don't interact, you don't develop any sort of relationship. And the food, you know, um, is not great because they have to transport a lot of stuff. So there's ways you can support the community, I think. And I think this is where it goes back. Montreal's community and why, how large it is, is due to the support they get from everybody else, right? So our markets or whatever it looks like has to do with how much support we give each other, right? So I think this is something to think about. It's only as good as the support that we put in. And I think that's why Aristotle is saying it's a, it's a social network. It's something that everybody has to contribute. We can't just think about our families and ourselves. Everybody's affected. So we're almost out of time. Um, the last thing I'll mention though, there is a number of different problems with this theory, but probably the biggest problem is tragic dilemmas. And I want you to guys read on that. Tragic dilemmas are, I think, what the young boy in New York is dealing with. If you go to school, or if he goes to school, then that's great, but he sacrifices his family. If he helps his family, he sacrifices his education. Sometimes virtue ethics doesn't have a good answer for some things like that. Seems like both decisions are poor decisions, like something's gonna suffer, right? Um, but what maybe the best response they have for that is that do the best you can in that moment. At least try, do something, don't just give up completely. But it's difficult and life is difficult. And that's why it takes practice, patience. So hopefully this was helpful and I'll record, I'll uh, edit this and, and post it on uh, Blackboard. And I'll see you guys next week, okay? If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, send me emails and I'll try to answer this. All right, take care.